from the oldest city in the USA, St. Augustine tonight, with our guest, Jock Mead, Eloy Castro Verde, Philip McDaniels and Will Hensler, and musical guest Corey on sax. With your host, Jorge Rivera. Center, the uh, <clears throat> St. John's uh, Cultural Council, Flowers by Shirley. Look at those flowers. I mean, yeah. Wendell Revis, that's the man behind that place. Ancient City Brewery brings us the beer. That way the jokes are funnier. And uh, Vectovision, you see the world in a whole different way with Vectovision. It's art and life and 3D. Boy, where do I start? Super Bowl? Watch the Super Bowl? Yeah. yeah. Well, I wanted the Rams to win because, I, I, you know, Stafford been there so long, great family. You know, he's paid his dues, and Burroughs was kind of young, so I thought, you know, give it to the, the older guy. Well, older. Huh. Yeah, so, so that was good, yeah. And wow, that stadium was unbelievable. Did you see that thing? Cost like $5 billion to build. I mean, they had $1 million suites for the game. I mean, $80,000 tickets also. I mean, I was like, oh my God, I think the cheapest ticket was like $6,000, $7,000. So yeah, the Super Bowl is not a poor man's uh, game. I used to pay $10 for the bleachers to see the Yankees, you know. All I got is a bunch of guys getting very creative with the English language, you know. So um, let's give a hand to Aaron Jackson. I, I, that, that's a black sister from Ocala that just took the gold medal in the 500 meter speed skating. I think it's the first woman who takes that medal. And she's a roller derby girl. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah roller derby people here. Yeah, that, that. You know, I was thinking, thank God the Japanese girl didn't get too close because she threw a little roller derby on her, huh? Send her skating away. So that was really good. I was really happy for her. And all her roller derby team were just in tears. They were just so excited. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Roller derby fans. They just found, or they think they just found, the Endeavor, which was the ship that Captain Cook used to get to Australia to start their history, whether it was good or bad. You know. But it's the Endeavor. Now, the Endeavor sank off Rhode Island. The Endeavor was refitted to become a cargo ship and it was called Lord Sandwich, which is a horrible name for a ship, but a great name for a sandwich. So they, they found it there. Australians and Americans are, you know, taking pictures and stuff, but they think they have the ship, the Endeavor, uh, known as Lord. It was lost during the Revolutionary War. Um, as the Brits were leaving, they started sinking ships. And so one of the ships they sank was the Endeavor. It's in very shallow water, so it won't be that. Puerto Rican news. Puerto Ricans were at home at night, and when they looked up in the sky, it looked like an alien invasion. What it was, was 50 satellites of Musk, Starlink, they blew up. They blew up because of a pulsar... Uh, a wave from the sun, you know, and they just blew up. And so as they were coming in the atmosphere and disintegrating, you just saw, I saw some people from their phones, and you saw these, it looked like alien ships coming to invade us. It was the coolest thing. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but I know Elon had um, news out of Belgium. This was funny. This farmer in Belgium was working, and he found this big giant stone, and he needed to get his tractor into his uh, farm. So he took the stone and he moved it like a thousand feet away. That's the stone that marks the border between France and Belgium. 
he just extended the border on Belgium's behalf by like a thousand feet. And uh, there are people who actually keep track of that stuff. And uh, it was a big incident with France. I mean, the Belgians are always getting these, uh, the French are always making uh, jokes of Belgium people, like they're not very smart. Well, they just have enough jokes like for another hundred years now. I mean, they're really going to have fun. I can't wait till I hear the first uh, Belgium joke concerning that stone. So that was one thing. Another guy went to his favorite Chinese restaurant. You know some of those cookies will have numbers on them? Your lucky numbers? He played them. Four million dollars he had. My question is, did he go back to the Chinese place and, you know, buy him an oven? You know, I hope he did. I hope he did. Bezos is in the news. In the, in the Netherlands, there's this, this steel bridge that's not used anymore. But to the people in the Netherlands, it means a lot for some reason. So they never dismantled it. They left it there. It's almost like a piece of art. Well, Bezos is having a ship, a yacht or something built. And in order to get it out, they need to disassemble that bridge. And the Dutch are angry. So what they started is a campaign if they dare to bring that, dismantle the bridge, they're going to throw rotten eggs to Bessel's ship. <laughs> so they're all collecting eggs and getting ready to see if it happens. I thought that was really cool. The last little piece of news is weed killer. They find out that one in every three Americans has weed killer in his system. So I start an experiment every morning. I go to this weed in the corner of my backyard. I go, I will keep doing this. I'll let you know at the last show what happened if I did kill it with my weed killer breath. That makes me like a superhero. And we don't have any weed killer tonight. We have, where is he? Where is Corey? Corey on sax is going to now delight you. He's amazing. I leave it all to Corey.
to the haze I've been going for days I am not fine Thank you for asking I've been thinking about you There's just no time So I won't lie and tell you that I'll see you soon You won't believe It's who you see I'm clinging to my sanity I'm too broke to choose And I'm too busy to lose Any more sleep Please excuse me while I chase these dreams Chase these dreams We're back ladies and gentlemen We're back with Philip McDaniel. I always want to call you Philip's McDaniels. I want to put S's in your name. You know, you're fine with that. So here you are. You know, I had you on my first show about six years ago. It was at the Corazon, which is no longer... Uh, at that time, the Corazon was starting out. And, um, and we, you know, the distillery was something different then than it is now. And so... I brought you here to tell me what, what's happening in the distillery at this time. What, what are the things that are going on? Wow. Well, A, thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you. It's so wonderful <laughs> to be back. And thanks, everybody, for being out there. I saw a lot of wonderful friends and neighbors who I haven't seen in a long time. So it's great to be back out, right? We're post-COVID. We're out, right? Nobody's wearing masks. This is freaking awesome. Um, so we're going to beat this thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, the distillery is, you know, continues to grow thanks to the community and, and uh, a lot of our partners. You know, a, a number of things that we've been working on lately are expanding the distillery experience. So for both locals as well as guests, uh, we're really proud that we've taken uh, a, a room that you, for those of you who are familiar with the distillery, you come in and you see the kind of the museum in the beginning and right. there was that movie we had. Mm -hmm. So we converted that movie room into actually a really beautiful VIP tasting room. We call it the Oak and Stave Room. Wow. And the whole room is actually built out of barrels that we've had that we've taken <laughs> out of service. And there are desks that are made from the barrels. It's really stunning. Wow. So in a month or so, we're going to be launching some evening classes there for wow. folks. Um, so they can actually come in and really learn more about bourbon and how it's made, and it'll be food and pairing with whiskey. So it'll be wow. kind of more of an evening kind of class. Oh, wow! Now, about how many people you fit in that we room? Fit about fifteen to twenty. So it's going to be very small, wow. pretty intimate, and uh, we're hoping to you know extend the hours a little bit and try and uh, try and get people you know central central to everything that we did when we started the distillery was education, right? Right. Nobody had made bourbon in the state of Florida before <laughs> us, um, and we've learned along the way. We had a lot of great counsel and coaches from uh, Kentucky, in particular a guy named Dave Pickerel, who was the head distiller at Maker's Mark, and he really put us on the path. And wow. since then, we've had a lot of great consultants come in and, and help us continue to make great spirits. So we now want to share that knowledge. Um, I was actually on the phone today with a group out of Kentucky called Bourbon Women. and uh, <laughs> Bourbon no, Women. it's true. It's this wonderful organization, Maggie Kimbrell. And, uh, and her team, and um, there are now, I want to say like seven chapters around the United States, from Atlanta to Denver, obviously Louisville, and we're trying to get a chapter here in Florida. And, and, and really what do these to... women do? They drink, uh, which is a good <laughs> <laughs> but, but in, in the process, they, they do what is really near and dear to my heart, is they do, they do good. So they give back to their communities, right. but they love getting together learning about whiskey, bourbon in particular, understanding the nuances between a weeded whiskey and a rye whiskey mm -hmm. and a younger right. whiskey and an aged whiskey. And uh, their, their chapters, you know, and, and bourbon is just such a popular wow. uh, spirit, as they say. Now, now exactly. you used to age your bourbon about, what, two to four years? But now you're eight, you have some batches that are being aged for yeah, longer? We're getting, yeah. So, uh, you know, in the beginning, obviously, it was kind of a challenge because we had to, like, make money. You have a business, you, you have to sell to make money. So what do you do? So some of our first bourbon releases were, you know, uh, in that two to three year range. And now we're pushing three to four. We have some that are even older. Wow. Um, so we're really excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing even what six months or a year will do to the character of a bourbon. Yeah. Um, we've learned that when we pull the bourbon in the cooler months, we get a much different flavor, calmer spirit, if you will, than if we pull it in the summer. In that summer, that spirit is really hot and it's actually pushing into the wood and the flavors tend to be much more wow. uh, just spicy and hot. And so we kind of like it. And so our guys have learned, hey, it's better to pull it in the cooler months between, you know, basically between November, December and, and, and April. So we're pulling a lot of stuff. We're bottling, we're bottling all. Well, well now that you yeah. say your guys, your guys now are working more than just that first shift that they yeah, used to work. Absolutely. We have a team, I think there's now 12 full and part-time distillers wow. at the distillery. It's kind of, it's a full-time. We've run a second shift 
Um, the, you know, knock wood, the good news is people like our stuff. and uh -huh. I love your stuff. I and love your stuff. Thank you so much, Jorge. We're really proud of it. And so um, we need to make more. And because we are a very, very small facility, by, by just scale in, in a four-hour period, Maker's Mark, who's a smaller bourbon house by Kentucky mm -hmm. bourbon standards, in mm -hmm. four hours, they will make more raw whiskey than we will make in a calendar year. Wow. Just to give you a size and right, scale. Right. So we, the only way we can make more is to run a second shift. So we now have a second shift right. that's going on. Guys are there. They'll be there till about 10 o'clock tonight. 10 o'clock Yeah. Tonight. And so we're, we're really excited about that. And um, so we're, we're making more spirits. And that's going to give us the ability to age even longer. And, uh, you know, one of the really exciting things we're doing at the distillery is now an experience that I brought out here called the Fill Your Own. So this is obviously oh, this, is, me, this is a let, sample. Let, let me hold it, Phil. Let me hold it. Yeah. Let me hold it. <laughs> Right. So the magic, to that, the magic to that bourbon, my precious, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the magic to that bourbon, if you can maybe flip that card over and see it, was we now have a beautiful station that was built by a, a local craftsman um, where you can actually come in and for a tw about a 15, 20 minute experience, you can actually fill your own bottle. It's really, Ooh. really cool. Um, the, the barrel that we pick is one of the oldest and best barrels that our distillers have. Now you're using selected. wine, porter wine yeah, barrels? Well, we, we're doing a number of different finishes right now, yeah. So our, to be a bourbon, it's got to be you know, aged in a new oak barrel. That's just right. part of the federal regulations. But one of the uh, kind of <coughs> new trends, uh, particularly in craft, is to be able to take that spirit and then you finish it in a secondary barrel. Oh. So, for example, um, we are using people who drink bourbon are familiar with Angel's Envy. Um, great company, right. uh, West and Lincoln Henderson, a wonderful company. They use port barrels and uh, they get their port from all over the world. We actually were excited. We're, we have a partnership with San Sebastian Winery who makes actually a really delicious award-winning port made from muscadine grapes. So mm. you're getting a doubly local product. Not only is it the first bourbon made in the state of Florida, right. but it was aged in port wine barrels with grapes grown in the state of Florida. Oh, wow. So that whole concept of terroir making something that's really unique and special that you can't get somewhere mm -hmm. else. So we're excited about that. So we have a number, uh, we have a new cognac finished uh, cast that's coming out. Cognac, and, yeah, another favorite. Yeah, it's really delicious. That's mm -hmm. coming out. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one of the new hot trends is to take a, a, a bourbon that's three, four, five years old, and then you put a secondary wood finish. So we have one coming out in probably about three months. It's going to be, it's called Double Oak. Mm -hmm. So it will have lived three to four years in the regular barrels, and oh. then we finish it in another new oak barrel to give it some character. Oh, wow. Well, let me change the topic here sure. now. You're sitting in a, in a very good board known as Discus. Yeah. What is Discus? So Discus is, uh, is the acronym for Distilled Industry Spirits Council of the United States. And Discus is... It's a national thing. It's a very national, it's an international board actually. Wow. Um, they're based in Washington, D.C. and the board <coughs> is made up of the largest spirit companies in the world. So it's companies like Bacardi, Diageo, Brown Foreman, Pernod Ricard, uh, Remy Cointreau, et cetera, these huge, huge, huge companies. And they have recognized in the last you know, five years uh, in the category of spirits, which is what these are, mm -hmm. um, there has been this just kind of revolution of production by small craft distillers. Yes. When we started our company 11 years ago, it's hard to believe, there were roughly 125 distilleries in the whole country. That mm -hmm. was it. There were two in Florida. We were the third. Um, today, there's over 2,300. Oh, so just 150, 2,300. It's just exploded. <laughs> yeah, and in the same way that the beer, right? Everybody, there's now there's like four or five, yeah, six yeah. Some craft breweries in every town in America. There's like 6,000 breweries in America. So spirits are following the trend of craft beer. And as a result, the big brands recognize those small distilleries are kind of where the innovation is, wow. and that's where things are happening. So they have invited a number of us to um, to be part of that organization, and I've gotten very active and involved, and I'm fortunate to, um, here in St. Augustine, um, I am serving as the chair of the Craft Advisory Council, which not only allows me to speak on behalf of all the crafts, but I actually have a seat at the big board. So we have a board mm -hmm. meeting on Thursday. Mm -hmm. It'll be a, you know, a, a video call around the country. Mm -hmm. but, um, so I get, and I get to speak and you know, be there to kind of speak up for the little guy on these very big boards. Yeah, 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 because um, something we were talking about is that people can order wine mm -hmm. and people ship the wine. I get my wine from California, sure. a company that introduces me to new wine and I love Malbecs and I try them all sure. the time yep. and so but but you you craft liquor people don't really have that it's the golden handcuffs no um, 
you know, spirits, alcohol is, you know, to, to us consumers, alcohol is alcohol, because whether you drink beer or wine or cognac mm -hmm. or spirits, you know, kind of does the same thing to you. So it really is all the same. However, the government looks at it in different ways. And because spirits are looked at and regulated differently, um, again, because spirits, craft spirits specific, specifically are fairly new, a lot of the privileges that have been kind of garnered and earned by other spirits categories or wine categories, in, in, in wine in that case, um, have, 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 the spirits haven't quite caught up. So today in America, there are 41 states that allow a consumer, you guys, to be able to, you can go online in California, Oregon, New York, whatever, and have those wineries shipped directly to you. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a privilege, right? It's America, you should be able to do anything you want. However, um, spirits, because we're still living under some you know, prohibition era laws, uh, only nine states in the United States wow. today allow consumer, you, uh, to be able to order from a craft distillery like us, and right. we think that's unfair. Right. And so we've been um, advocating really hard, and what the audiences can do um, is stay tuned. Certainly, you know, follow us on, on, on our Facebook or anything, but we're putting together campaigns to try and get, certainly Florida and yeah. other states, yeah. to be able to modernize. All right. we're asking for is parity, because mm -hmm. look, you know, when I make a bottle of spirit, if I have a guest who's coming from Missouri or Chicago or New York, they have a great great experience, experience. They buy their first bottle they go home they finish it and they want to buy more you know normally any other product you think of amazon right you pick up your phone your amazon prime you can have yeah. you know the next next day, day. <laughs> and and you can't do that with spirit so we're mm -hmm. trying to we're fighting hard to, to modernize mm -hmm. it so that's a lot of where i'm spending my you know kind of personal time right now is having well, well, well the other thing i love of your of your distillery is how much you you how much you invest in this community mm -hmm. this is one of the institutions that you actually support But, but there's all these other, uh, there's Habitat for Humanity, there, there's all these things. You also work very close with the Amphitheater, yeah. and, and uh, you supported this show when I first started. I really appreciate it. You're very you kind. Did that, yeah. You didn't really know me, but you saw the passion, and uh, you always ask me that, what's your why? Yeah, That's your the why? question. Simon yeah. Sinek. Anybody mm -hmm. Simon Sinek fans out there? Awesome. Good good good. Good. And, and um, so you, life. so, what, where are you there with the community, the programs that you're in? Yeah, you know, thanks for recognizing that. When uh, my business partner, Mike, and I started the company, I said 11 years ago, we sat down and we said, you know, what do we want, to, what do we want this thing to be? And, mm -hmm. and obviously it has to be a viable going concern. You have to be able to you know, pay your staff and, and make a return on, on your investment and for your investors. Uh, but we also, you know, I, I'm at a stage in my life I'll be one year older this year, I won't say how, but, um, okay, 65, that's it. Um, but you get to a point in your life where you recognize your time is finite. And I've always been uh, a believer, you know, in a couple of things, a few things. Number one, that unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, uh, we're not gonna live forever. Two, whatever you have, you can't take it with you. And the third thing is if you can leave your community better for next generation, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So it started, so, for my family, my wife and I, Wendy, we've lived here, you know, coming on 30, I don't know, wow. coming up on 30 years, and we mm -hmm. started, all started with Project Swing, for those of you guys who are longtime residents and know mm -hmm. that playground by the VIC, it started there for us, and we've been really, really fortunate to be able to get involved in a number of things, and so when, um, when we started this distillery, I said to Mike, I said, what's really important to me mm -hmm. is that, and he said, I'm, I'm all in, so we've, we've tried at every turn to give back, um, and we're really, really proud to be able to support um, things like the amphitheater, the Sing Out Loud Festival, uh, the Fort Mose Festival, which I'll speak to you in, in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly this year we will build, uh, in six years, we will be building our sixth Habitat home. So wow. Amazing. And there's no greater feeling. Uh, for the um, we support, obviously, the great work being done here at the Lincoln mm -hmm. Museum and Cultural Center. Um, and, and just a number of other things. But you know, we, we believe that when you reinvest in your community. So the thing I want to talk about, if I can right now, mm -hmm. uh, United Way, by the way, we're really, really excited about. We were, uh, we're doing more work with them. And we were, Mike and I were just recognized, the distillery was recognized two weeks ago at their annual meeting as the corporate sponsor of the year. So mm -hmm. we, we won that from United Way just because their work and that was amazing. But mm -hmm. this I really wanted to show, if you can maybe have, if you can so somehow show that to the camera audience. But, show to that camera, um, we'll show to this guys camera, can zoom in on that. So mm -hmm. this is a really great thing. You, you know our love of music and, and the amphitheater and, and Gabe Pellisier, who's just a, a really great champion. He's a guy who now is running the amphitheater he has for 
uh, many, many years, but he approached me to do a really kind of, to take jazz to a, a really, really high level and, and asked me if, if the distillery would support that, and I said yes. And anyway, long story short, we ran into the folks at Fort Mose, and they were, they are looking to build and raise money to actually have a fort. When you go to the Castillo downtown, you see the fort, there it is, right? Mm -hmm. When you go to Fort Mose, if you've ever been there, it's like the first question is, where's the fort? Right. Um, and it's not there because it was burned down, you know, 100 mm -hmm. years, several hundred years ago. So this campaign that we're part of is actually going to build a reinterpretation or a reconstruction of that fort. And we have five of the top <coughs> jazz artists in the world who are going to be there. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there yeah. Friday for Count Basie. Yeah, Count Basie. Yeah, can read that off. Be Gregory Porter. Gregory Porter, for those of you, if you don't know his music. Amethyst uh, Kia. Yeah, Amethyst Kia. It's great. Mm -hmm. We got the Tank. Tank and, and the Bangas. And the Bangas. Like the dance. She's amazing. She's and and really Trombone really. Shorty. So those, yeah, so. Yeah, so. It's, it's going to be awesome, and all the money for this event is going to go to help Fort Mose. We've been really, really lucky. Um, Congressman John Rutherford, who's a, a dear friend of, of ours and been a champion for the distillery for years, mm. um, I, I talked to him a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, would you help us? And uh, not only is he going to come to the concert, but um, this past week on the floor of the, of the House, he asked Speaker Pelosi, can I have a minute to talk about something that's near and dear in my heart? And he actually spoke about Fort Mose oh, on the wow. floor during Black History Month. It was a pretty wow. amazing thing. So that was incredible. Uh, we have, I think, Senator Travis Hudson coming, uh, Representative Cindy Stevenson, um, several county commissioners mm -hmm. will be coming, I think hopefully the city commission. So we're really trying to do a big push on this. And it's not only to raise money for Fort Mose, but to get the word about Fort Mose and its story. Because It's, for those uh, it's who crazy don't, how people don't know anything. Don't know. And yeah. it's, um, and the history is, is unbelievable. Yeah. And, um, you know, I could talk for you forever. Yeah. Well, Too bad I, I, we, I, we I don't have that time Thanks. forever. Well, but, um, but, you know, you are someone I admire in this city very, very much. And everyone who talks about you, oh, you know, it's, because it's, you, yeah. yes, you, you have the heart of the community and, and you're someone who, who doesn't have to do this. And he is. And that's. That's a big, big thing. Well, there's the work that you're doing, your crew, your team, your audience, you guys showing up and being here and supporting live art, live music, the wonderful, you know, uh, saxophonist we just had here. This is what makes the world go round. So mm -hmm. the fact that you do, you've served on the Cultural Council, you've done so many great things that have helped mm -hmm. us go. Home. So thank, thank you. you. And we'll, we'll, keep, we'll be here as long as you'll have us. So thank you so much. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll be back after these messages. Support Fort Mose. To the haze I've been growing for days, I am not fine. Thank you for asking. I've been thinking about you. There's just no time, so I won't lie and tell you that I'll see you soon. You won't believe it's who you see. I'm clinging to my sanity. I'm too broke to choose, and I'm too busy to lose any more sleep. Please excuse me while I chase these dreams. Chase these dreams. We're back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back with Eloy Castro Verde. It means a green Castro. Yeah. And uh, I met Eloy at an event in Ponte Vedra, where I believe you were showing some of your photography. And Correct. Suzanne Shunka was there, too, who's been on the show. Matter of fact, I saw her last night at a party. And um, I was just amazed by your stuff. Look at those photographs there. Look, look at those photographs. Eloy, e Eloy travels the world uh, to, to photograph, um, you know, animals, uh, birds, um, gorillas, uh, you name it. And um, I, I just thought it was amazing. Uh, uh, look, look at this cheetah. I know someone who's not in the show today. If she saw, she'd steal it. She loves them. Yeah, it, it's just so many. And we're gonna talk a little bit about his photography. Look at these penguins. Aww. Yeah, penguins are always, always, always great. Here is a zebra. Look at that. And um, he doesn't pay these animals to pose for him, you know. Look at this, look at this. Look at the colors on that. And here, here's our last one, which is, uh, there's another one I'll show you in a little bit. Eagle. So Eloy, 
when, when I talked with you, I realized that you were a very successful man in investment and finance, and you worked a long time with Bacardi, uh, which is interesting that we're talking about this. Exactly. Uh, and, um, and then it came a time when you retired early, and you told me that you started taking pictures of your son's basketball games. Exactly. Yes, well, first of all, I want to say I'm super excited to be here tonight with you and with all your guests. All this right. This is awesome. But, uh, yep, you're right. After uh, my career as an executive with Bacardi, uh, we moved here and my boys were starting high school. Um, and uh, they were playing basketball. Mm. Uh, I remember my father taking pictures of my brother and I when we were young. And whenever we, you know, later in life, we'd go visit with him, we'd look at, pull out the photo albums, and it's just the memories that came back, mm -hmm. it was awesome. Now, now, you left Cuba when you were like two years old or two something. Two years old. And the Castro was sweeping the country, and those who left, you were some of those who left with your dad. Right. And you and your dad were very close. And yes. so, so he used to take pictures. He was you. always involved with our sports, coaching, assistant coaching, but he always took pictures and, uh, you know, it, it was, it's great memories, you know, 30, 40 years wow. later to watch, to look at pictures when you were 10 years mm -hmm. old and you were playing peewee football. And right, right. So I wanted to try and capture some nice pictures of my sons playing basketball and, uh, you know, Basketball, is a, it's a dark arena, it's a fast sport. Yes. And of course, when I first started to try to take pictures, it was terrible. And I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta learn how to do this. Right. So I had to you know, understand cameras, understand lenses. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand the sport through the camera, that you have to move before them. Like totally. they have to walk into your frame, not you trying to stick them in there, yeah. And, and, and you gotta difficult. keep the referees out of the frame. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But I started getting better at it, and then uh, I started taking pictures for the whole basketball team. Mm. And then I started taking pictures for the, the whole school, for all their sports. Oh boy. Busy. So this was Bowles. Um, so that's oh. how I got started with photography. Wow, wow. Where do you take this leap from going to basketball to a silver-haired gorilla? I mean, <laughs> he doesn't play basketball, I know that. No, no basketball no. there. I love his face. Um, well, I, I did sports for quite a while, and then um, I've always loved the outdoors, nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. living in Florida, you're surrounded by right. beautiful, you know, beautiful scenes and, mm -hmm. and birds and everything. Mm -hmm. So St. Augustine has a birding and photo <coughs> festival that they hold mm -hmm. once a year. Yes. Oh. So I attended that and it's, it's like a three or four day event. They bring 10 professional photographers and they hold daily sessions, whether they're a classroom session or it's a workshop where you go out with the photographer and photograph things. So I signed up for that and uh, took some sessions and really enjoyed it and met some people I really liked. And I slowly started to get into that type of photography. Learning from the, from the pros, from the ones who've been at it for a long time. Exactly. And, and when did you take that first trip that wasn't to a basketball court <laughs> or a baseball uh, field where you said, well, today we're going to go photograph yeah. birds or animals or whatever? When was that well, first? Well, my first trip actually was with one of the uh, photographers who was there, mm -hmm. you know, doing a seminar, and uh, I listened to him, and, and he was brilliant. He knew so much about wildlife and animals, but he had a little bit of an accent. So mm -hmm. after the, after the the session, I walked up to him and you know introduced myself, talked to him, asked him where he was from. He was from Cuba. Ah, so the connection. <laughs> Now your buddies, now friends, your buddies, exactly. yeah, yeah, your buddies. So uh, he does lead tours, and one of the first trips that I did was with him and maybe like six or eight other photographers, <clears throat> and it was to Costa Rica. Oh wow! Yeah, that's a very abundant place for photography of that kind. You have everything, all sorts mm -hmm. of birds, all sorts of frogs. Ja they have jaguars snakes. too and stuff like that. Like yeah, we stuff. didn't do any of that, but I mean, the variety of, of yeah. animal life is, is incredible wow. in Costa Rica. Wow. What, 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 you've been to Costa Rica, you've been through Africa, which you told me is maybe your favorite place. Yes. What makes Africa so special? It's just so different. Uh, I mean, first, just traveling through Africa, and you know whether you're in Tanzania or Kenya, you know you're in a jeep, traveling through the savanna, and 
just animals as far as you can see or, wow. or even going from one town to another. It's just, it's amazing. And then of course the, the wildlife is, you've got everything from, you know, all the gazelles to all the lions and all the cats and you know, the zebras. And they're and wild. Everything is wild, yeah. Wow. I, I remember I had a friend, she taught English in Namibia. And I said, what did you like, my baby? I like in my classroom that as we were teaching the lesson, the giraffes would just go right by the school, <laughs> you know? And she would step out for the kids. It was like, this is every day. Right, I mean, yeah, to them it's... What's her problem, you know? And she just couldn't believe that that majestic animal was just feet away. When you take those pictures of those gorillas, how close are you? Well, um, the gorillas uh, from Uganda, mm -hmm. and basically you, um, you have to trek to where they are, so they'll have uh, scouts that go out there to, to try to find them, and then you're with a guide, and they try to guide you to where they've spotted them. And so the park is called Bewindi Impenetrable National Park, mm -hmm. and impenetrable is there for a reason, <laughs> <laughs> because it's just, a jungle. I mean, we had guides basically with machetes at okay. times right. cutting through so you could come through there. And how they find each other, I have no clue because there's no roads or saying take a right, take a left, you know. But, but basically when you arrive with the gorillas, um, you're only allowed one hour there. Mm. You're not allowed to get too close. I think it's, it's maybe 100 feet, if I, wow. I remember correctly. Um, but the gorillas are just doing their thing, you know, mainly eating, but they're moving around and they're inquisitive too. So they'll come up to they'll you. They'll come up to you. Oh my God. <laughs> they weigh like, what, a thousand pounds? I mean, these things could. They're big, yeah. They're they, they, could just, <laughs> they could just crush you with their hand, just crush your arm. You told me something well, where a female came up to your wife yes. and bumped her. So my wife fortunately gets to come on all these trips, which I love because. When I first started doing this, I'd come back with pictures, but it, just the experience of being there is yes. so different. So yeah. I finally got her retired so she could join me on these trips. And, wow. and I call her my Sherpa, even though she doesn't uh. carry anything for me. <laughs> <laughs> but we were standing there and she uses her iPhone and it's very good using her iPhone. Um, and um, there was a silver back and some females and some young ones and one of them basically came walking towards her and literally like from me to you. Wow. And just stood there and stared at her <laughs> and then just walked by her and just kind of brushed her a little bit. <laughs> Almost like saying, that's my man. You stay away from him. Oh, <laughs> wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now you've also been to the Falklands. That's way out there. Why the Falklands? I mean, I've only seen documentaries of the Falkland War yeah. and, and there's not much there. It's quite barren. That's it. There's nobody there. Well, there's very, very few people there. Right. And there's right. thousands and thousands of penguins. Wow. Oh, um, so that's where that picture was from? Yes, that, those are king penguins. They have five different types of penguins there. Mm -hmm. um, those are, these are king penguins here in this picture. Yeah, they don't walk on ceilings. <laughs> and if, I don't know if you can notice it, the audience may not be able to see it, but this one here has got a little bit of fur around yeah, the body. Yeah, he looks like he has a little fur coat on. Well, when they're born and they're, they're young, they're just a big f flur, a fur ball, basically, mm -hmm. with brown fur all around them, and they slowly shed that. Mm -hmm. And once they've kind of shed it, then they can start going into the water. Wow. But um, five different types of penguins, each one with their you know, individual personalities. And, um, yes, yes, like dogs and cats, they have yes. their own personalities, you know. And, they and have these, these are called ping, king penguins, very majestic. They walk down the beach. They have some that are called rock hoppers that literally hop up rocks and come down these big rocks mm -hmm, to jump into mm -hmm. the ocean. Well, the last time I talked about you, 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 you were planning a trip. It was on your bucket list to a place called Eloy, Arizona or something like that. All right. <laughs> did, you, did you make it? We did. Oh, wow. We did. Now, that, a... that one wasn't a wildlife trip, but uh, we did, uh, my wife and I did a trip. We went to New Mexico. I did a little photography there um, mm -hmm. in, in near Albuquerque. <clears throat> then we went to White Sands National Park, which is beautiful, did mm. some uh, landscape photography there. All right. And Eloy, because my name is Eloy, has always been on my bucket list to go visit. Uh, so we did, and uh, it was hilarious because as we were approaching Eloy, 
there was a sign that said Eloy next three exits. And we said, oh wow, this is quite a, a big city, three exits. <laughs> so we got off the first exit, and uh, just as we got off, there was a fire station there, and it said Eloy Fire District. So we stopped there. I said, I gotta get a sign next to the Eloy Fire District. Uh, uh -huh. So I got out, Debbie's got her phone, she's taking a picture, and all of a sudden the fire truck's coming in. And, she, and they say, do you, are you guys okay? Do you need help? And uh, we said, oh no, we're, everything's good, thank you. I said, my name's Eloy, and this has been on my bucket list to come to Eloy. <laughs> so I'm gonna take a picture at every Eloy sign there is. Uh -huh. So they were super nice. They yeah. came off the truck, you know, they said, well, we're gonna put the truck in. Do you wanna come in and take a picture yeah. by the truck? Yeah. And I said, sure. Yeah. And then one That's guy funny. went inside, and he came out with a baseball cap that mm -hmm. says Eloy Fire District. Oh, he goes, here. wow, <laughs> wow. You know, that, that, that's what people don't realize that uh, Americans or all people in general are, are very kind hearted, you know, especially when they Extreme. meet a stranger. Yeah. yeah. And did, I guess traveling in the world, you notice that more and more, you know. Yes, yeah, everywhere you go. But and, and in Eloy, we did, we did a water tower, we did mm -hmm. Eloy Airport. <laughs> <laughs> we stopped at one I can one see all sign. these pictures of you there. Yeah. there we is. saw one, one sign that said, Welcome to Eloy by the side of the road. We stopped real quick. And I was standing behind the sign, and Debbie was taking my picture, and I see this car pull up, and this person in a military uniform get out, and I said, uh-oh, mm -hmm. I think we're in trouble. We're not supposed to be here. Uh. And this lady comes up to us, and she goes, you guys are tourists, right? We go, yeah. She goes, oh, I wondered, do you want me to get your picture? Uh, <laughs> so you see, if people uh, are extremely nice, yeah. no matter where you go. Yeah. Now, of all the trips you've done, was there any, any because you've been to see the Falklands, you've been to Africa, you've been to uh, Central America, Central in the United South States, America. Alaska, bears. Yeah. You went out on a, on a grizzly bear shoot. And, and polar bears. And polar bears. I mean, is, is, I remember when we talked last time, you had told me that you had a trip for Botswana that you had to cancel because of COVID, right. and it's gonna be like in 2023, 2023 or something like that. Yeah. But Botswana would be very interesting. Yeah. Was there any of these places where you ever felt in danger? Um, maybe naively, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know these are wild animals, but whenever I go on a trip like that, especially to a foreign country, we always use local guides. Right. And these are people who are used to being with these animals year after year after right. year. So I rely on them 100%. Right. So we listen to them and they tell us how close we can yeah, get. Yeah, yeah. Um, They'll say, like, stop, stop. He's yeah. in a bad mood right now. I'd take two steps back if I were you. Well, mm -hmm. like with the polar bears, for example, um, there's six or seven photographers. We see a polar bear in the distance. We've got backpacks and tripods and everything. And you know, you put it on the ground and you're kneeling and you're shooting. But all of a sudden, if that bear starts coming at you, the guides are gonna say, everybody pick up everything off the ground and come together in one big group. Uh -huh. Because if you leave your backpack on the ground, it's a black backpack, they could think it's a seal. So oh, they're okay. gonna come investigate. Uh -huh. Right, right. So once you get everybody up together and you put, you know, everybody stands together. Like a phalange. Yes, yeah, so uh -huh. you're, you're a little more powerful against that uh -huh. over there. So wow. they kind of, you know, they look I mean, at you and they uh -huh. kind of walk. Do I want to take them all? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you told me something very interesting because we've run out of time. Was uh, you went to a trip that didn't go well, like the weather and everything. But someone said, you want to take a picture of an eagle? Yes, actually, there's... Yeah? So Bring the magazine over here. I'll find it while you tell I, the story. I think it's right in the first... Mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, it's right in the middle. So it's basically a, a, a bear trip to Alaska. And the one thing about wildlife photography is you're guaranteed nothing. You don't control anything. You don't control the weather. You don't control the wildlife. Uh, you may not find the wildlife. And, you might wait you know, forever. You can't say, turn this way mm -hmm. or turn that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. So this is a trip where we we're gonna be camping by the river where the bears were congregating for the salmon run. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately a storm came and wiped out all the tents. So we couldn't get there. And then we thought, well, maybe we can get a plane to drop us off on a daily basis and fly us out again. Mm -hmm. But the winds were too strong, so we couldn't uh, go. So we were stuck in Homer, Alaska. And um, there are some eagles that fly around because they're fishing. And we were out there photographing and somebody came off their, their house and their deck and they said, hey, what are you guys shooting the eagles? We said, yeah. Sorry, I say shooting, I mean a camera. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they said, well, do you wanna, you wanna see how that eagle comes right down to our deck? And I said, sure. 
<laughs> and he went and he got some piece of fish and you know the the size of the deck was probably from your chair to maybe the wow, end of that. Wow, that's small. Yeah, and I got all the way down on that end. <clears throat> with your camera. And with my camera and just and you know, sat that down eagle. and waiting for that eagle to come. And he came in. Whoa. That's close. Yeah. That's close. Look at that eagle. And that was full frame. There was no cropping or anything. Right. Like that. that was like, wow. That's as close as I want to get. Those things are very strong. Yes. But what's your website? My website is greenfieldimages.com. Greenfieldimages.com. And uh, the pictures there are just, they make these look like amateur. I mean, they're just you know, almost like you can stick your hand in the screen and, and touch them. And um, if you have an exhibition anywhere, let me know, man, because have, this is great. Uh, in, we're in February, right? In, in March, the Ponte Vedra Beach Library um, has a speaker series, and so I'm the speaker for the, Mar for the month of March, so it's, I think it's March 15th, mm -hmm. there's a presentation, but throughout the whole month of March, my pictures will be up throughout the library. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing this incredible art and skill that you have, my friend. That is um, mesmerizing. What's that big bird called? Snowy owl. <coughs> A snowy owl. Snowy owl. Look at that. Unbelievable. It looks almost from an alien planet. Unbelievable. That one's from Quebec in Canada. Wow. Wow. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Greenfieldimages.com. And we'll take an intermission and we'll be back.
We're back, ladies and gentlemen. These are our, this is what we call our sliders, and they're usually here for about three minutes each, and to tell us about something. And we have Amy Angelelli. Yes. And Amy is the way she came to me is she does uh, laughing yoga, <laughs> yoga with laughter, and she has a whole thing of building confidence. Tell us a little bit about your your website and, and what you do. Okay. So I, I do laughter adventures. I teach improv and do improv shows and then I'm also a certified laughter yoga leader which petrifies people because they assume they're gonna have to do a down dog and laugh their way through a down dog and a down dog is an uncomfortable pose for most people and guess what? There's no poses. Mm -hmm. So in order to be successful at laughter yoga all you need to promise to do is laugh and breathe. And most of us laugh and breathe normally. Mm -hmm. The problem is we don't laugh and breathe as much as we did when we were kids. Right. 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 So this brings us back to our youth when um, we didn't have an inner child because our inner child was outer and inner and everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So now, you know, if you have that three year old kid around you every day, this is your chance to be that three year old kid. Right. So it's stretching, clapping, laughing meditating and relaxation. And, and how does it affect people? What's the improvement that people see in their lives? It's, it's amazing to see the transformation in an hour period. You know, people will go from really tense and stressed out and nervous, 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 because they feel like they're gonna be put on the spot. Mm. But mm. you do it in community, mm. so, or, or in your mirror by yourself, mm. if you want, Jorge. So you could start your day off with a laughter yoga routine, right? Uh, Goldie, yeah. Goldie Hawn does it. Goldie Hawn does it by herself in, in her bathroom mirror every morning. Mm. So because it's done in community and you have that, that fake it till you make it attitude, you know, you're asked to laugh for no reason. Mm -hmm. And when you do, and you do it in community, then that, that fake laughter becomes organic laughter, Okay. right? <coughs> you know? And so what's your website? My website is uh, www.adventure-project.com. Adventure dash dash project project dot com. Dot com. And there they could sign up for classes and all that kind of good stuff. Mm -hmm. Improv classes, laughter yoga sessions, improv shows. More laughter is good for us individually and as, commun as community members too because we can spread that around. Mm. So it's healthy for us as individuals and it's healthy for us as we build community, right. especially coming out of the pandemic. Right, 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 right. So we need to give ourselves permission to laugh more. All right, let's give her a hand. <laughs> <laughs> My other person here is Brandon Santiago, and he's a painter. <laughs> you, you, you have a lot of fans. <laughs> And uh, yeah, wherever I go, oh, I know him. Oh, Brandon. Oh. I'm surprised that Jules is in here tonight. Um, she, she's, she's, she, oh well, someone's keeping schedule. Good. And uh, but you, you have things now. You, your art, you know, you remind me a little bit of, of Basquiat. Yes. yes. When when I look at your work, if you know Basquiat, he was uh, half Haitian, half Puerto Rican, 
New York City boy. Uh, Andy Warhol was, uh, loved them to death, and they did projects together. But his art was something like this. And um, in this piece here, what, what is it trying to communicate to the person of, of looking at that? Well, uh, with my art, uh, I like to consider myself an expressionist painter, meaning uh, thoughts, feelings, emotions during that time I get to. <coughs> take that moment and put it on canvas. And the way I paint involves a lot of uh, lots of layering, uh, line work, and uh, it all comes together. And it's uh, a lot of decision making in the process. It's living in the moment. So when, I, when I look at that, I see a face in the middle. Yeah, to me, it's, yeah. I see a face. Yeah. I bet a lot of people say that. I, love, uh, I see the lips, I see the nose, I see the eyes, I see the shape of a head, yeah. you know? I love painting. Uh, faces and figures, it's so much uh, energy uh -huh. to uh, capture. And uh, it, it comes together, um, and it's a healthy, healthy release, like you know, how you do here. Mm -hmm. uh, Laughter yoga. yoga. Mm -hmm. it, it feels good, it's an indescribable feeling whenever I finish a painting, and right. it gets me uh, really, really excited. It's like a d do you feel like it's finished? Because I've talked to some painters that they say, well, it's finished for now. Yes, yes. Unless someone buys it and I can't go back to it and, and, and change something. Because the artist looks at it and say, huh, you know, like everything, you know, if we cook a dish or if we do yeah. anything, I could have done this, uh, express myself a little different. Yeah, um, there's moments where I, uh, I go over and paint over things I, you know, uh -huh. I think I can improve on. But I feel like when, if I add something that will take away from the painting, that's when I'm finished, that's when I should be. Mm, all right. Yeah. And now, how young were you when you started dabbling with the paint? Um, I started getting serious when I was 17. I'm 22 now. All right. Uh, oh, you're so old. I'm grateful for the, <laughs> all the support. Thank you for having me. You're welcome, my friend. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what galleries are carrying your art? So, uh, the main gallery I'm at right now is Art Box. Oh, Laura, Laura must be out there. Yeah. Laura must be out there. Uh -huh. Art Box is a, a wonderful gallery, not just because they're my friends, but because they do bring really, really interesting uh, painters, and, and there's all kinds of things there. It's that they're not just doing one thing, they're allowing the expression to be complete. Yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, uh, how big is your biggest piece of work? Um, I have a couple of uh, four feet by five foot canvases. Wow. wow. Have on display at Artbox right now. Actually. All right, all right. Do, do you have a website? Yes, uh, brandonsantiago.net. So oh. B-R-A-N-D-O-N, Santiago. Santiago, yes. That's, uh, <coughs> on, my, on my mother's side, that's her second, her second name, Santiago. Um, so yes, go check out his art, art box, check out Brandon Santiago, the website. And um, yeah, that's what we like to do here is introduce you to a new artist um, so that, you know, uh, art is... Um... Is this for sale? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, art is such a part of, of man, you know, when, even when you go back, it's funny when they go in a cave that's half a million years old, they'll see something on the cave. It's like, we need to express ourselves in, in this fashion. I thank you so much for being on the show, both of you. We'll come back with Chuck Mead. Back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back with our last guest. His name is Chuck Mead. Some people here know him. Uh, he's very popular in town. 
and uh, Chuck is a marine archaeologist. Uh, correct? Yeah. Okay. I'm not that great with science. But, um, and, and wow, our conversation was an hour long when we met several uh, months yeah, ago. When I invited you to the show and then I wanted to talk to you about your life and, and, and this whole career. How would you define a marine archaeologist? Someone says, well, what's a marine archaeologist different from an archaeologist? Uh, well, good question. Uh, so um, an archaeologist is a scientist who studies human behavior in the past, mm. uh, typically by going through people's trash, uh, going through the things that we have. 10,000 year old trash, uh, yeah, that's or more. Pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, a marine or a maritime archeologist is someone who is interested in human behavior in the past, but with a particular focus on the ocean or seas or lakes. Mm. So essentially I'm interested in shipwrecks Mm -hmm. uh, I want to learn about people who lived in port cities, just like we all live in a port city today. Right. Uh, but, you know, 100 years ago, 200 mm -hmm. years ago. And so human beings have always had a relationship with the sea. Right. Uh, the ocean connects us uh, to other places. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, ships and boats is how human beings have brought, mm -hmm. you know, animals and goods and people and ideas from one continent to another. And, and the planet is basically water. I mean, we're on yeah. the water planet, so yeah. it's a really interesting kind mm -hmm. of archaeology, mm -hmm. understanding human beings' relationship uh, with the ocean over time. How did, you told me when you went to school, or what your, your first dream was to be a writer. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> and then somehow you ended up in, in this, in, in, by talking to you, you're fascinated by what you do. You just love it. How was that transition made? Um, well, I, you know, I always loved writing. So I guess I, I uh, like a lot of your guests here, I like to express myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a kid, I, I, I always had a love for history. I always had a love for the ocean because I grew up wow. in Atlantic Beach, not too far from here. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... Uh, I, I enjoyed writing so much, I wanted to write that great American <laughs> novel. And when I got to uh, Florida State University, which is where I went, and I found out they had an underwater archaeology program, and that just kind of spoke to me. Because mm. I loved the idea of history, and I was thinking, like, well, you don't need to be an English major to be a writer, so maybe I could study some of these archaeology mm -hmm. classes. That's it, interesting stuff. It, it, you told me that the book by Tolkien made a big impact <laughs> on you when you read uh, those books. I, I read Lord of the Rings when mm -hmm. I was in third grade. Third grade, uh, oh my God. Uh, well, Some... it took me until fourth grade. <laughs> yeah, those uh, words were like this big and they right up. A lot, of, a lot of pages. Uh, uh -huh. you know? mm -hmm. uh, but it, I guess the, the way that he created an entire world uh, that was unfamiliar but also familiar. You know, if, if, if you uh, are a fan of history, it's not that unfamiliar. So right. the, the fact that it was a very rich uh, tapestry of all these languages and cultures uh, I think that really inspired me to e even have a greater uh, interest in history and anthropology and culture. Right, and right, right, kind of right. You told me a fascinating story that when you were up in uh, Tallahassee and you, um, someone said that there was a wreck out there somewhere in a river and you and this other uh, female student yes. uh, decided to go, let's see if we can find it, which is what young people do. I can do it. Well, we had to, so we had, this was in a class uh, at FSU, uh, and it was a wonderful class. So every weekend we were doing some kind of diving training or some kind of project, and every student in the class had to run a project. So we decided together, we're, this is going to be our project. Mm -hmm. We're going to go find the shipwreck and then we're going to bring all the students back and we're going to dive on it and make and record it, make a map of it so we understand, you know, try to figure out what this shipwreck is. Well, the, and a state archaeologist had told us, oh, there's a wreck in the in the confluence of the two rivers. The, the, uh, but Saint no Lawrence one had River. found it yet. Uh, he had seen it, supposedly, wow. uh, because he knew it was there, <laughs> but no one had, no archaeologist had looked at it with anything other than a passing interest. So we were mm -hmm. determined we were going to go find it. And we go out there, and it's uh, about this time of year, I think. It was oh. like February, March, and it was chilly, oh. and we were swimming around. We didn't know what the heck we were doing. Now I know a lot more after mm -hmm. doing this for 30 years. <coughs> uh, but we, I mean, we even got kicked out of the water by the Marine Patrol because we didn't have a dive flag at one mm -hmm. point. So that was a little embarrassing. Uh, and so after a number of days and swimming around, probably aimlessly, and we still couldn't find this thing, and my partner, she was done. She was fed up, mm -hmm. and she's like, this, that guy's an idiot. 
there's no shipwreck out here. We would have found that. We've been swimming everywhere. We're not going to, you know, we're, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. Forget this. Mm-hmm. And I, this could have been my whole career. Uh-huh. You know, you never know. Why? Uh, so I was like, well, let's, let's do one, one more swim. We'll just start here and we'll swim along the shoreline, at, you know, about this far out. And we'll just swim up to that dock way down there. I picked something way far away so we'd have mm-hmm. our best chance of finding something. Right. And she's like, okay, okay, one more time, but that's it. That's and so it. we're swimming. And it's a, you know, it's a river, so it's kind of dark. And we're swimming on the surface, but it's pretty shallow shallow so it's only four feet of water and you can see the bottom and it's just uh seagrass you know just mm-hmm. river grass and then all of a sudden there's a strip of sand and a strip of river glass and, and a strip of sand and a strip of grass and a strip of sand and then all of a sudden where those strips were instead of strips of sand all of a sudden there are timbers so oh grass wood wow. grass and so those strips were where your the heart must have been oh, like my heart was like oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, because then then we stood there and we're out, you know up up to uh, here in the water and we're like oh my god we just found a shipwreck holy moly this could be anything you know wow. this could be because uh, we knew there was a spanish fort there where right. the two rivers came together so there was a pirate attack on the fort and there was a ship that was burned by the pirates and of course you know we were like oh this could be a pirate ship it could be a spanish your ship. mind is spinning oh well, we're going on you know it's wow. just going like this. this could be a you know a steamship carrying cotton from the 1800s mm-hmm. it could be anything and right there at that moment, I said to myself, oh, this is what I want to do. Mm. <laughs> this is, this mm. is, uh-huh. this is what I want to do. Yeah. And uh-huh. I've been doing it ever since. Wow. And, and, uh, and when you went back to school, you were rock stars, huh? <laughs> uh, you, you know, because you, know, you, know, you, you were what, 20 years old, probably? Uh, gosh, at that point, yeah, I, was, I think I just turned 21. Wow. Uh, that, uh, and here you, here you found, found your first ship. Uh, I found a ship, and, and we got a little experience. I got a ship. What you got? Uh, 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 yeah, uh, then I found a cannon a few years later. Oh, that wow. Was that was an exciting one. Then I was on the you know, now, newspapers and. USA now, you, and all right, stuff. you found you found the ship out in Texas. Yeah, yeah, that's off the, the one water, of Texas, about. and 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 that was like you were in the dark, and you couldn't see, and suddenly you felt something very long and 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 and, and like met, and it was a cannon. Oh, yeah. That was uh, so that we were looking for La Salle's ship. So this is the French explorer La Salle, mm-hmm. and his ship was lost in 1686, and they had been looking for it since the 70s. Wow. So this is the mid 90s. And we were, you know, towing our equipment, our metal detecting equipment. So we knew we had a good hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we were diving. I was the second team in. The first team came up and they're like, oh, there's pieces of wood everywhere. And they had a musket ball. And so we were like, okay, this is a good sign. We may be on a shipwreck. And then I went down with my buddy and I'm feeling around in the dark. And it is pitch black. Mm-hmm. I mean, you literally, and, and that's pretty typical for mm-hmm. us, but... You could, you know, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. <laughs> so it's just by feel, and you gotta trust that your buddy, you know, she's mm-hmm. less experienced. I was a fireman. Fire. I know like, what it hold is. Hold on, hold when there's no visit, like exactly. And right hand like search, said, right hand I search. Put my hand right down on a, a metal loop, and the first thing that went through my head is like, oh my god, this could be a dolphin from a cannon. And then I'm like, okay, what? So a dolphin's like the lifting rings, and they mm-hmm. are usually cast mm-hmm. to look like dolphins. Back in LaSalle's time, in the 1600s, mm-hmm. it, it, it could be this highly decorated dolphin with big sea monster teeth and all mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. craziness. Well, and, and I was saying, I remembered the flintlock pistol we thought we had found in the dry tortugas that when we x-rayed it, it turned out to be a nail that was like a big <laughs> So I'm like, okay, there's no way you found a cannon. I mean, come on, what are the chances? That? If you found a cannon, there'd be another handle right... <gasps> Oh, there it was. There's two of them, which is exactly what there should be if it's a cannon. And then I just felt down one end. I took my buddy and I put her hand on it. And later she said, oh, you were screaming the whole time underwater. (laughs) (laughs) But I got to one end and there was, uh, you know, I got to an edge and there's the big ball, the cascabel at the end of the cannon, the buddy of the cannon. And I got back to the other end, made sure my buddy was still alive. Got back to the other end and felt the muzzle and could put my fingers inside wow. the door. And it's like, okay, this is a can. Yeah. Wow. And when we brought it up, it was a bronze gun. It had the dolphins looked like sea monsters. It had a, a crossed anchors on it with the, uh, the, the Count de Vermandois. He was uh-huh. the Admiral of France. Mm-hmm. And then King Louis XIV, the, the Sun King's crest. So a big mm-hmm. uh, L. Uh, it, wow! It, it was amazing. Wow! That was a pretty cool. One. <laughs> well, another one you told me that was very interesting was those ships, sixteen ships that crashed. 
here oh, in Saint. Yes, here in Saint Augustine. So there was this 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 group of guerrillas fighting an empire. They defeat the empire, and those working for the empire have to be evacuated. That sounds so similar to something else. <laughs> yeah. And so they're taking. They're just, they're just getting out. So who were they? Who were they? So this is during the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, the world's greatest superpower is Great Britain. Mm -hmm. It's the British Empire, which mm -hmm. the sun never sets on. And these upstart colonists uh, in you know, what is now the United States have started a war. They've started mm -hmm. a revolution. Now it's not, uh, you know, pe people often think like, oh, well, the Americans versus the British. Mm -hmm. And it was really Americans versus Americans, right? Mm -hmm. Because not all of the right. Americans, you know, many of them were mm -hmm. loyal to... Yeah, it was America. like the Civil War in yeah, many ways. It was, it was very was much like the Civil, the Civil War. Those who were loyal to, to exactly. the King George and those who, who were not. And so the, so the people who were loyal to King George, it became clear that, well, our side, you know, the king's going to lose. Gotta get out. And, the, and no one could believe that. It was a world turned upside down. But right. it was happening. And so the king said, well, I'll reward anyone who has been loyal to me by evacuating you at no charge <laughs> to another <laughs> colony. Uh -huh. And so there was a massive exodus. And the colony was what? Where would they bring well, it up? this colony was East Florida. So uh, East Florida, uh, here in Florida, was not Spanish at the time, but it was a loyal British colony. Mm. And so the evacu this particular evacuation, so first Savannah was evacuated, then Charleston, then New York. Those mm -hmm. were the three big British centers of power right. uh, towards the end of the war. Well, this is from the Charleston evacuation. And mm -hmm. it's so many people, I mean, more than 11,000 people wow. are getting the heck out of Dodge. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many, there's more than one fleet uh, and the last fleet to evacuate them lost 16 ships trying to get into the inlet. In Here in St. Augustine. Uh, we've had such a dangerous inlet, always, uh, that it, is, it, it was known. Uh, you know, there was a, a traveler, uh, 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 Johann Schopf, one of my favorite guys. Right. Now, how did you know the people on the ship were British loyalists? Well, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, because we, we, so we had suspected this was one of these loyal right. ships. We knew there were 16 of these wrecks, so there was a decent chance we had one. The time period was right. We had late uh, 1700s. Uh, but then it comes to the question of how does an archaeologist tell what someone's politics are? Right. You know, how, how can I tell if my neighbor uh, voted for Biden or voted for Trump? Right, right. Well, I could, you know, during election season, that's easy. They probably got a sign on there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but but you know, hundreds of years, 40 years later, how uh -huh. did you tell that? It's not, you know, uh -huh. there's not that many things. We weren't sure what we might find uh -huh. that would tell us mm -hmm. if, if we had loyalists. Mm -hmm. And then we found it. And of course, we knew as soon as we saw it, uh, it was a button. Came in the smallest of packages, had a little crown on it, and the letters RP. And the crown obviously kind of represents royalty, right? Mm -hmm. uh, RP stands for uh, Royal Provincials. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are Americans who have joined the British Army mm -hmm. to fight against the rebels. Mm -hmm. And so we found that button and we knew we had loyalists on board. Uh, so that was circumstantial evidence. It's not maybe quite enough to have, you know, 100% proof, but pretty good evidence. Right. Well, then we found a button from the 71st Regiment. And we found a button from the 30th Regiment and the 63rd Regiment and the 3rd American Regiment. All of these buttons are regiments in the British Army. The only thing they have in common throughout all of history is that they were all in Charleston. And on December 18th, 1782, they all boarded vessels in this fleet, the same fleet that lost 16 ships wow. in St. Augustine. Wow. So that was one of the most spectacular. I mean, I've, I've been lucky. I've had a lot of spectacular mm -hmm. finds, but the storm wreck, we call it, because we don't know its name. Right. Uh, but we know everything else about it, and it is just an amazing shipwreck. And there's so many, you know, come to the lighthouse and you can see on display. Right. Uh, you know, uh, actually, we're getting the muskets back soon. The muskets have been oh. finished being conserved, so that'll be new. Uh, we've got cannons, we've got the ship's bell, we got a fake watch, we got all kinds of cool wow. stuff. Wow. Uh, really, you know, the, the knockoff Rolex from George Washington. Oh, wow. Uh, that's too funny. <laughs> that's too funny. That's too funny. So, is there a ship that you're looking for, that you've heard, there's something out there that everyone's looking for and they haven't found? You had said something about La Olas. 
yeah, what was it? Nuestra Señora de las Olas. Ah, uh, Our Lady of the Waves. I mean, that's just yeah. a pretty cool ship, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, so, a so there's a rumor that that ship, it was a big ship? Um, I don't remember offhand now, but I know that's one of the ships mm -hmm. listed in our database. And whenever we come across any historical reference of mm -hmm. any time period to a ship being lost in St. Augustine, <coughs> waters, mm -hmm. we put that in the database. Right. And I think that one is, I think it's late uh, 16th century. So wow. Late 1500s. Now, can, the Europeans help you out looking in their archives if you find um, a seal or something so, that they still have yes, these archives so, where they can look? Sometimes we uh, help ourselves. So uh, with the storm wreck, I went to London and uh, went to the archives myself. Oh, wow. I came back with a thousand photos of documents that were related to this evacuation of Charleston and all the wow. other things we were talking about. Uh, in fact, the reason we don't know the name of our ship is because I had this sheaf of documents, you know, this, this uh, sheaf of papers, this document, and the page that l would have listed the names of all the ships going to Florida was missing. Oh. So I have the names of all the ships going to Jamaica, to Halifax, to London, to oh. St. Lucia, but the ones going to Florida, that's a, that page is gone. That's a gut so, punch right that, there. That uh huh. huh. <laughs> It's gone. I mean, it was exciting, you know, I mean, it was amazing and exciting that we had, I'm reading this handwritten document from Unbelievable. 1782. Unbelievable. And someone has signed it saying, oh, these are all the ships going to all the different places. And then at the same time, it's frustrating because that one page is missing. Well, it, interesting. The last slave ship, the Clotilde, Clotilde yeah. in Alabama, yes. that they burned it because it was illegal to transport slaves, but slavery was not illegal. Correct. But you couldn't bring more. And that is the last ship. And what shocked me from that Clotilde is that Quest Love, the drummer for Jimmy Fallon, his ancestors were on that ship. Really? And when the guy showed him that document, this Tony Gates or whatever, he, you know, he checks out sure, all sure. the back, and he showed him the document, and he saw where his ancestor came from, what part. Oh, I, I started amazing. crying. I just started That's crying. Because his mind, he's not a sentimental guy. But you saw he was just frozen there because he knew nothing of his family. And that he, his family was on the last slave ship. That was contraband because you oh, said it was a bet they did or something? Uh, it was a bet, yeah. There are two, you know, wealthy white oh, landowners wow. and they made a bet. I bring some, get, some get a slaves. Ship, bring a cargo of the oh, here. oh, my God. Mm, that, that I know. It could even be a thing. Yeah. Uh, but oh, it's an it's it, evil. It's an amazing story, and it's mm -hmm. kind of, I guess, the last epilogue mm -hmm. to this mm -hmm. slave trade. Right. Uh, because uh, that was certainly the last slave ship to come. And they all back. stayed in one place, so they kept their heritage. They kept their uh, Africa. That's yeah, Africa Town. Is yeah. The that was started. Because these guys, you know, I mean, clearly these guys had literally yeah. just come off the boat. Yeah, because the Civil War was when, just ending yeah, when they and, got and here. Basically, it was like, well, it's, you're free now. You're free like, now. Well, yeah, we, we uh, just want to go home. And yeah, there's, there's no, no way. way. to go home. It was, right. You know, it was an expensive voyage. Yeah. And yeah. We weren't going to yeah. 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 Unbelievable. Now you know why I spoke with him for more than an hour. <laughs> oh, I thought that was normal. You don't yeah, do that with everyone? <laughs> no, no. So, so I thank you so much. And uh, the work that you and that, that Lighthouse Museum whole organization does is amazing. And I think that people in this community do not appreciate it enough. And it's, it breaks my heart because it is just one unique thing that's not, you don't find it everywhere. It's a very very unique situation where you have a museum, you know, in one sense it's an attraction, you mm -hmm. have so many tourists coming here, mm -hmm. that gives us dollars that we can then put to right. preserving those historic buildings, to having a research program right, right. with vessels that go out <laughs> to the sea and discover shipwrecks, to teach kids uh, uh, at summer camp and all kinds of educational programming, a uh, wooden boat building program. So there's a lot of stuff we do at the lighthouse. And there's also a report from the marine police that you punched a shark in the nose. <laughs> I don't know if we have the, time for that story. The, yeah, yeah. The shark, the shark did not press charges, but that's for another day. And uh, thank you so much. Love to have you. And um, wow, we learned so much tonight. <laughs> we'll be back with Corey on sack.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming to the show. We couldn't do it without you. We love you, and uh, our guests were great. Let's give our guests all a hand. And uh, I'll see you next Tuesday, same place. Too broke to be